Um, so, good morning. M my name is Daniel Aaron. Uh, I'm from Bangalore, India. And so, I, I, grew up, I grew up Protestant, but since I was surrounded by a lot of Hindu friends and I, d and I just liked re reading up a lot about other religions, so, and so Hinduism was a big part of it. So, so this, is, this is basically Hinduism. So, let's start. So, Hinduism is mainly worshipped, uh, is mainly followed in India and certain parts <coughs> around the world. Like Hindu, Hi Hinduism is one of the oldest religions, still, still practiced religions in today's world. So in India, it's, it's predominantly in India and as, as you can see in other parts as well. Okay, so from, from what we know regarding Hinduism, it was around 3000 to 1500 BC, BCE. So we know this from a lot of the texts that, text that we ha they have of Hinduism and sacred poems like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. So the, they had, people have researched this for years and from, from this and all, uh, all known variation of these texts, this is where, this is the timeline they believe um, is when, when this happened. So, so the Vedas, the Upanishads, so th these, these are the main texts of, the, of Hinduism. Uh, so so the, the Vedas is divided into four different texts. So you got the Rig Veda, the Yajur Veda, the Sama Veda, and the Atharva Veda. So the Rig Veda is the fullest of, the te of all the texts. It's, it, was ar it has around 1,028 hymns. And the, the, Yajur, the Yajur Veda is a handbook by, for, for priests for performing Vedic rites. Uh, the Sama Veda is for like singing songs, chants, and tunes in temples and things like that. And the Atharva Veda, um, most it's, it's, it, it preserves a lot of traditions that, you, that most Hindus still follow nowadays. Uh, it predates like the Aryan influence in India. So the Aryans uh, basically came, came, into, I, came into India like a long time ago. They came in from the north and the Aryan race like just swept through India and that's, that's basically how it happened. So the so the clergy in so the clergy in Hinduism is cons considered of Brahmins and Sadhus. So Bra so Brahmins so they I guess the best way to explain it they I guess they kind of like the priests. They kind of so they, they they teach you how the Hindu texts work and they give you knowledge and their interpretation of how, what it is. And so so Sadhus um, holy men they give up their worldly pl 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 pleasures to to follow the ways of to follow the ways of the Rig Veda and the uh, of all the Vedas, um, so the so f for Hindus they 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 worship in temples. There are there are a lot of temples in in, in India and other places of the world. Hindus are very particular about keeping to various auspicious days, auspicious moments. They they very they very precise about their traditions and things like that. So, uh, like, so for example, the Ganges, they believe it's actually a goddess, and e each each year people go in there and they purify themselves. They bathe in the Ganges for the, for its healing power. Oh, I just need to check something. Okay, now so so some of the some of the things that. Uh, some of the festivals that Hindus uh, follow is Holi and Diwali. Uh, Holi is, 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 is a lot like, is, is the festival of colors. Uh, people go to the streets and they play with, they play, they dance and they sing. Uh, it's, it's mainly like, it's, they basically just like throw colors around and have fun and they dance. That, that's Holi and Diwali. Oh, Diwali is like kind of one of my fa most favorite Hindu religions. Like, so just like how we ha you have the 4th of July here, uh, you, you just throw fireworks, uh, you just light up fireworks and rockets. Diwali is the same thing. Um, this, is, this is in celebration when Rama brought, brought back Sita after he, after he defeated, um, what was the name? What was the name? Oh, Ravana, this name's right there. <laughs> I forgot. So, 
So, so basic, so just like how you just have rockets and stuff here, we 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 call them patakis in India. That's a little something from there, uh, and they and we burst crackers for for a couple of days, and the whole of India is on holiday, and everyone's just having a great time. So that's that's D Diwali. Um, okay, I'll I'll, I'll let Avi Avishay do with you with that. Okay. So, so one. This is one of the Hindu one one of Hindu's beliefs. It's Nirvana. So what they believe is that we humans as human souls go through cycles of reincarnation. Like we die once and then we come back again. We do this multiple times. And uh, when we when we live uh, when they live a righteous life in all these lives, then that's that's when they can reach God. So just um, f for example, in Buddhism, um, he believed that most people don't, don't need to go through all the, the various cycles of reincarnation. They can reach God through by following his path. So that's how they learn. That's the, that's the difference between Buddhism and Hinduism. So in, in Hinduism, they, they, do, they don't follow the castes nowadays as as big as they did back then, but these are the diff different castes. The Brahmins and the priests were the right on top. Kshatriyas were warriors. A lot of them also were kings. Uh, the Vaishyas were like farmers, merchants, and craftspeople, and the Sudras were servants and laborers. So this was still followed back in the British times, but not anymore because it's it's an, it's not it's not it's not a very it's not a very good system of uh, dividing people away. So, so in Hinduism, there are three main gods. God Brahma, this the f he's the first one, he's the creator. Then you have Vish Vishnu and you have Shiva. Uh, so, Br Brahma is, so, so Brahma, the way, the way who Brahma is, uh, when, when a human soul dies, they, they go back to Brahma. So Brahma is the start of all things and everything ends with him. And then, then you have Vishnu, the preserver. Uh, so a lot of, a lot of, so Vishnu has has many different uh, identities or avatars. They usually call them avatars. Uh, the the time, the, the reason he's called the preserver is because at times on the human plane, when there are issues, when when there are like issues that steering uh, humans away from the right path, and there's there's like huge big cal cal calamities that are f gonna fall them. Vishnu, re he f f forms an incarnation of himself on Earth to help humans pass through these difficult times. So that's an example of Vishnu's avatars are like Krishna and Rama. So th these are some of his avatars. And then, then we have Shiva, the destroyer. Uh, Shiva, Sh Shiva is the third person in this tri tr trinity of uh, the main Hindu gods. Shiva is called the destroyer because thing, all things end, end with him. So they, they believe when the world has reached too much of corruption, Shiva is the one who, who, will, who will bring about the end and restart the world. So he, the, he, they believe he has a third eye. And the third eye, once it opens, that's, that's, when, the world will, that's when the world will end. So, um, well, that's my presentation. And I hope you understood a lot. Avishai will, Avishai will talk to you guys more about the daily life of Hindus and more about their various customs and rituals. So thank you. All right. Well, um, I'm super, I was super excited about, uh, about this opportunity to share a little bit more about Hinduism. So, um, so my name is, uh, if living in America, my name is Avishay Chan, but living in India, it's Avishay Chan. So yeah, I think you heard him calling me Avishay. Well, that's like really rare out here. Uh, it kind of like reminds me of being back in India again. It's just a pronunciation. But um, so uh, Brother Schmidt asked us both to present on this. And as you know, Daniel, he was from, he's from India. And I'm not from India, but I mean, probably from my complexion, you can tell that I have Indian descent. Um, my uh, my ancestry is from India, uh, so uh, a little bit more about me. Um, I was born a Hindu, raised in that culture, and about at the age of 16, um, 
a couple of friends introduced me to uh, to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, and I learned a little bit more about. I, I actually didn't know who Jesus Christ was, to be honest. Really, like I knew I used to use his name in vain a lot, uh, as probably most people most people in the world do, but. Um, for me personally, uh, I didn't know who he was until I learned a little bit more about him. But um, for me, I only knew of uh, mostly so that Trinity that he talked about, um, as well as a few other gods. I'm sure you guys have seen the god with the elephant head. You know, you read it in the reading, Ganesh, then you have Hanuman, and a few more that I'll probably go over. But um, to me, to me, those were those were gods. Those were people who, or you know, figures that I that I worshipped and that I um, that I really, you know, believed in, and I felt them to be real. But um, in addition to that, I also served my mission in New Delhi, India. Uh, I don't know if you guys this last general conference they just announced a, a temple, or two general conferences ago uh, they announced a temple. In, uh, in Bangalore, India, uh, where Daniel is from also. But um, uh, my conversion, it, it was really interesting. Uh, a lot of this stuff that Brother Schmidt talks about in the World Religions class, I had to kind of think about. Like, what's the best of, um, of our religion, you know, being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and what's the best of being a member of, uh, being a Hindu, you know? So for me, it was a little bit difficult. I, I, at first, I asked the missionaries if I could worship like my gods, but then also have like Jesus Christ there and, you know, smash them all into one and, you know, everyone, everyone's happy. But uh, <laughs> as I started learning a little bit more, I gained a testimony uh, and understood a little bit more about the doctrines of God and Jesus Christ. But um, as I was saying before, I served a mission in India. I was there for, um, for about a year and a half and... I was in the Philippines for visa issues, but for that year and a half that I was in India, I learned a ton about Hinduism, stuff that I didn't know about when I was growing up here in America. It, I mean, it, that in of itself should probably say how much the religion is, um, it's a way of life, it's a culture, it's a... Um, in their politics, in their school, it's all, it's everywhere. Um, and it's very colorful too, as you can see. So um, I just wanted to go over a little bit about the culture side of it. Uh, also a little bit about, you know, the beliefs and how, you know, what is it like to be a Hindu? I kind of want you guys to feel like, you know, obviously you won't really feel that, but, um, you know, just get a close understanding of what it's like to be, to live a life of a Hindu. So. This next slide here. So this is a picture um, of my mom and my stepfather. She she was uh, recently remarried. They waited until I got back home from my mission. But um, uh, my stepfather comes from a Catholic background. Uh, so this was pretty interesting for him. Like look, that doesn't look like a Catholic wedding, I don't think, right? So um, th and that's my mom there. And you can kind of see that they have this, you know, they have this clothing on, this marital clothing, and it's very. Um, it's honestly very colorful and very flashy. Like they like to put like rhinestones and stuff. It's really cool. I like it. Um, and then this this right here is a Hindu priest, um, kind of like like Daniel was talking a Brahmin. So um, and what we call them is a pundit. Uh, so this is someone who kind of leads out your congregational prayers and stuff like that. It's to the equivalent I like to think of as a bishop. Uh, if, if, the, if, you can, if that makes it easier to understand. So here, uh, what he does is he says a lot of prayers. It's kind of a binding uh, almost. And, you know, if you guys kind of think about our, our gospel, right, we have things that bind us together as well. So, um, and he does little rituals that, you know, he's got, he's got uh, rice and food, and this kind of represents, you know, like, what are offering to to God or to you know the many versions of God and there's also a fire that gets lit over there um, and that kind of represents purity and also protection uh, for, like in the fire God so um, I'll go ahead and go to the next slide here so this is kind of what I was talking about with the fire so notice something interesting there that uh, that cloth that's tying both the husband and the wife together. That's, uh, and, and they make seven circles. They walk seven times around the fire. 
So this represents, um, for one, eternity, that, you're, that you are tied together, and that you are every time they go around the fire, that represents a vow that, uh, that they make to one another. So um, in that vow, they, or they have seven vows because they walk around seven times. And you can see, so what are, what are some things that stand out to you guys with this clothing? Um, maybe that you don't see all the time. There's a lot, but what, what do you guys see here that m might be standing out to you? Yeah, go ahead. The color red. The color red. Yeah, what do you think that means? It's symbolic of something. Yeah. Oh, you're going to say the same thing? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's it's so Hinduism is really interesting just for the fact that there, like sometimes there's like multiple meanings for the same thing, but yeah, definitely energy. Um, also love. There's a lot of that there as well. Uh, red is also like a warm color. You know, brings warmth as well. Um, you. C I also want to point out some other things. You can see her. She has bangles on, right? Um, and that's kind of that. That's really common with married women to have uh, bangles along with, there's like a piece of jewelry that you can see going across her forehead and up through her hairline there. That is called a mangal suit, and that means like that, like she's married. She's, you know, so, so w today, you know, in here in America, like, you know, girls have rings, right? You know, like diamond rings or whatever. But there, it's like, I don't know if it's like a, f you know, it's, it's kind of flashy, I feel like, but it's also, you know, just to show like I'm, you know, I'm married and, you know, I've found the one kind of thing. So, but yeah, it's really interesting to see how that works. So earlier I talked a little bit about the, about the seven vows. So I'll just go ahead and read these out loud. It says, um, the first vow says the bride and the groom and the groom would provide prosperity as a household to the family and would stand against those who try to hinder. The second vow says the bride and the groom would lead a healthy life by developing their physical, mental, and spiritual. I think I, I meant to put uh, attributes as well. Their third vow says the couple would earn a living and increase by proper means so that their materialistic wealth increases manifold. The fourth vow says the married couple would respect, love, and understand each other and would acquire knowledge, happiness, and harmony. The fifth vow says the couple would expand their family by having healthy, brave, and honest children for whom they will be responsible. The sixth vow says the bride and the groom should have self-control of the mind, body, and soul and should have long marital relationship. Finally, the seventh and the last vow says they promise that they would be true and loyal to each other and would re remain companions and best of friends for the lifetime. So, anything stick out to you guys in these vows? What do you think? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just thought it was cool that um, they also promise that they will have uh, prosperity. We also know that as a commandment. Definitely. For sure. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Definitely. Mm hmm Yeah. Really good connection. I think it's interesting that it specifically says like materialistic wealth and that they will always strive to have to have like have an increase in that wealth. Mm hmm Definitely. Yeah, pretty interesting, right? Yeah, I thought so too. Any others? Yeah, over here and then over here. Mm hmm Yeah, definitely. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah, we should always try to marry the best of friends. But what something interesting about um, Hinduism, especially, or it's kind of leaking onto the culture of India, is um, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with arranged marriages. Um, pretty interesting, right? I mean, I don't know how many of you trust your f your parents to uh, kind of choose a guy or a girl for you to to marry. It's kind of scary, I know, in American culture. I know some of you guys are like, whoa, you know. But in India, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty much all the marriages are like that. Um, they, uh, they, they trust, the, it's kind of an honor thing, you know, like, or trust. You trust your parents enough to do that for you. So that, you know, when you pointed out best of friends, that's kind of like a, um, like you get to learn to know them and to love them kind of thing. Uh, one more thing that I wanted to, 
uh, point out right after that is for the lifetime. Isn't that interesting? For the lifetime. So it's not like how we believe with eternity, but it's um, you got that life with your companion and then reincarnation, or you just move on to the next stage of life, or of your next life, I should say. So, yeah, really interesting to see those, uh, those differences and those similarities. Uh, so going on, uh, we talked a little bit about religious dress. You can see um, the woman in the middle, she has the mongol suit there. And then this dress right here, they're, they're saris. So uh, very common uh, in India with their, um, with just kind of with their dress code. You can also see a lot of times it's very modest as well. Um, just in that, I feel in that region of the world, we talked a little bit about Islam and how they believe in modesty. Well, it's, uh, very common as well here. So um, go ahead and continue. So uh, another thing is respect. You can see here, this is, a, this is a, it's probably a wedding from what it looks like. You know, the guy has that, you could see in the other slide too, he has this kind of hat looking thing. Um, he is touching uh, her feet. That might be his father, or I mean his mother, or um, his mother-in-law. But a way that you show respect in India is you go down and touch their feet and kind of like touch your heart or your head. That, that shows like, like you are being so humble and low to do that. Uh, like it's so offensive actually, it's something with Indian culture, it's really offensive to, um, to touch someone with your foot or like, I don't know, like I, when I was in India and I was serving my mission there, sometimes I would, it's so crowded there by the way, that it's highly populated and sometimes I would accidentally like step on someone and the dirtiest look would be, you know, given to me. And at first, I didn't understand. It's, I was kind of scared. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> but but I, I quickly began to learn that that is a sign of disrespect. But, when, but this is a sign of, you know, being most humble. To go down and, you know, you can see he's um, the father or the father-in-law is kind of like, you know, like, thank you. Like, and they, they, to, for them to be kind, they kind of say, oh, no, you don't have to do that. It's, it's an interesting culture thing. So, but respect is very, very prominent and big in India, and Hinduism especially. So Daniel touched a little bit about temples. Like, there's so many different types of temples. Um, this right here is, uh, so the Hindu word, or the Hindi word for uh, temple is mandir. Um, I remember like when I was a lot younger, my mom and my dad would take both my brother and I to the mandir a lot to uh, go pray and to go worship the gods. Uh, in the next slide, I have another picture of what it's like. By the way, do, has anyone ever seen this temple before? Yeah, we're... we're yeah, Spanish Fork, Utah. Does that look like Utah? <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to point that out because... Uh, India is like, you know, the, Hinduism is everywhere. Uh, that's kind of what I wanted to, why I picked this photo specifically. Um, is because it really is everywhere and, col you know, th just that color is very bright. You know, it's, it's very prominent in that religion. So, um, this right here, do you have a question? Oh, no, you're just funny. So, this right here is uh, the Las Vegas Mandir. This, that, so, I'm from Las Vegas. And... Um, you can see right behind the pundit, so the priest, there are different gods. And um, a lot of those gods, you know, they're statues, and you go and pray to them directly as if they're there. Uh, a lot of times you'll also see, like, um, fruits and, uh, like, you know, fruits, maybe milk and things like that as offerings to God to show God or the different gods that you... Um, that, that you respect them and that you want to give what you have to them. It was really similar to uh, the Old Testament, especially with, when they offer up sacrifices, right? Uh, there's, a, there's so many parallels here that are, I mean, there's more than I ever thought there would be, especially after, you know, researching some more. So, um, but yeah, they, they're really big in, um, in having those statues there for you to physically see and be able to um, picture them as being there, so continue on. So there's, there's a thing called puja. Puja means uh, prayer. So um, this is kind of like your, uh, if I were to translate it into our religious words, your sacrament meeting. Um, 
here is when you, you, you pray to the gods again, and you can see all those fruits right there, like so many of them in flowers, and uh, this is all to show respect to God, to the gods. Um, and then you also have your fire there as well as, a, you know, protection and the purity. So a lot of that takes a play into this as well. Um, let me just continue. So Puja, Parsad, and Panchamrita. So this is, I really love this. Uh, so Parsad is basically like the fruits that you eat. And Panchamrita is a, uh, it's like a sweet milk that gets passed around. Does that sound like anything? What does that sound like? It's like the sacrament, like and I and it was hard for me to make that connection at first, but it wasn't until I got baptized that I really started thinking about like I went to another puja after I got baptized, and I remember eating the the prasad and then drinking the panchamrita, and just thinking whoa like I just felt like I I think yesterday in sacrament I just had bread and water, um, it, it's it's not all the same meaning behind it, but. Essentially, like, you know, you can see they, they go around and they pass it to people. Uh, and just a really cool parallel between our gospel and theirs. Another cool thing is that in, in uh, puja, in the prayer, they sing a lot of songs. They're called bhajans. So um, it's really common, like, with hymns and stuff. There we go. So we talked to, so we, you already mentioned holy, right? And uh, Daniel spoke a little bit about Diwali. So, um, if we go on here, here's another one called Raksha Bandhan. So that's me right there on my mission. Um, I, w I visited a member's home and I was like super surprised because they were like, oh, elder, like we want to do Raksha Bandhan. So what this means is, this is kind of like a way that the sister, the women in the family, like the sisters and the men in the family kind of show like love for one another and respect. Um, so the way that it works is, is like usually the, the male in the family, like the brother, will give the sister some kind of sweets, and then in return the, the sister will give them money. Um, I know, pretty interesting, <laughs> but uh, um, I always like my side of the deal too. So, <laughs> But it was, it's really interesting to see how the Hindus really, um, how they show their love and their respect to one another. Uh, someone over here, I think we talked about like, you know, materialistic things, right? Um, that's, that's so prevalent in, in Hinduism, I feel like. And in the gospel, we, we talk a lot about how we don't take any of that stuff with us, you know, into the celestial kingdom or into heaven once we leave. So uh, it's, it's just really interesting to see that. You can see that she has um, a little fire. There. There's always fire, always, you know. And she's putting, she has like some red, I don't know if you guys can see that red stuff over there. But um, it's like it's a it's like w red powder, kind of maybe the same stuff they use for holy, a little bit of water on it, and you mix it up, and it becomes kind of like a uh, wet clay, and that's what they put on your um, on your forehead, and that's uh, that's a little bit of a sign of like you know purity and of um, you know being closer to God. So pretty interesting. Yeah, go ahead. I yeah. I used to work for a big company where fifty percent of employees were Indians, mm -hmm. and they're all were different kinds of those dots. Like sometimes it would be white, sometimes it would be red, mm -hmm. sometimes it represents how strong their prayer was in the morning. So what is the like general idea for it? Because they're all explaining to yeah, yeah, so um, that's a really good question. So basically, like with pundits and Hindus, they'll always have it. Like they, the, the, so like the priests, right? They, they will always have that kind of mark on their forehead. And that just represents, you know, it's, with Hinduism, it's a lot about your outward appearance, right? So they wear, like missionaries, we wear a badge all the time. Hindus, they, like, they, they've got the clothing on, they have those marks on as well. So a lot of the times when they have that, that um, kind of that mark there, they probably just prayed or they just had a little prayer. Um, so things like that. And so whenever I saw people with that, I knew that, oh, he was just at a mandir or something uh, or a temple and he just prayed. So, yeah. What about the women that wore, wore like the little decorative like, jewels on them? Yeah, yeah. So, that, so that's called a tikka. So um, that little decorative jewel is, well, now it's like jewelry. It's like, you know, super cool. Like, oh, look, at, you know, fashion, you know. But back then, that was another representation of uh, being, um, being married. So 
uh, that's the really good question though. But in India, you can still find that. Uh, but it's becoming, uh, the reason why I say things are changing so much is because they really are. Like westernization is, you know, it's hitting India pretty well and people are becoming more and more westernized like uh, America is. So all good questions though. So I just thought this was a really cool picture. <laughs> in Holi, like in Indians just have no, uh, they, don't, they don't hold back. Um, like, they, they knew we were missionaries too, like because we live in the same area. And these kids, you know, I don't even know where they came from, but like they'd be like way up top and like different apartment buildings and stuff, and just like pelting us with like different colors. <laughs> so I have a couple of white shirts that are a little bit more colorful than what they should be, probably. But <laughs> but it's just a fun festival, a fun time to uh, you know to uh, come closer to everyone around you, and uh, it, it really is a festival of colors. So. And then uh, Daniel spoke a little bit about Diwali. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah. So, and because you said the mission there, so there, if people did convert to the gospel, did they still like, largely take part in all these different festivals just because it's more of a culture of the place? Or did they kind of hold back and like not participate so much because it is still considered part of the religion? So that was like su a super good question. Uh, because it was difficult for the members to understand that line. So it's kind of like that line, right? Like, can we still do this, you know, even though we're no longer Hindu? And like, for things like that, definitely they can, you know, they can definitely participate in those. What we were always taught and what we always taught the people of India that, you know, were converted or baptized, we always told them, you know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, with having fun with the cultural traditions. It's just the actual worship of, you know, other gods that we don't, that, that is not okay. You know, that's, that's breaking the commandments. So it was, and sometimes that would get a little bit difficult trying to find that line, but, um, but yeah, it would just be mostly, you know, um, you can go do those things for fun, but you can't, it can't be for the purpose of worshiping God, worshiping a Hindu god or something like that, if that makes sense, so. Yeah, great question. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about my holy envy and, um, you know, just some other points. So here you have a, uh, th th this is a picture of Hanuman. Um, and I have a quick story about that too. So um, I remember my, uh, w one time I was talking to my mom and this was when I was a lot younger and she's like, you know, what did you think about that prayer kind of thing, that puja, you know, and stuff like that. I was like, oh, I thought it was really good. I said, you know what? I think Hanuman is my favorite god. You know, I, like, I was like, I think he's my favorite. He's super cool. And she got mad at me. And I was like, what? Like, you know, she's like, she's like, you should never pick a favorite god, you know? And, I was, and from that day, I was like, I can't do that anymore. And again, I was like repenting, like, you know? <laughs> and I felt bad. But um, I, I just, so there's a story here. You can see, okay, what do you see on Hanuman's hand? What does that look like? Can anyone tell me? Yeah. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah. It's a mountain. Yeah, it's a mountain. So, um, Lord, I think it was Rama that uh, he fell sick. He, his brother fell sick. Yeah, his brother fell sick, and he needed um, he needed this type of herb or flower to help him heal. And uh, Hanuman was commanded to go out and to get this to to get this herb to help uh, Lord Rama's brother get better, you know? And Hanuman was like, okay, I'm gonna go do this. Uh, I'm gonna go, you know, do what I'm commanded to do. So he gets up and um, he realizes his, his kind of his strengths. So he, um, he goes over to this mountain and he's able to fly and he's super strong, obviously. Uh, and he gets, and he, and he looks at the, he's at this mountain and he's looking around, he's like, I cannot find this herb. So what does he do? He gets really big and chops the mountain in half and grabs it and flies it back over and brings it back. And you can see here Rama's brother that's not feeling well and he has this mountain where this herb is found. And I thought, man, what a cool story. Like, you know, if, you, if you're asked to do something, you go tenfold and you do it, you know? And this is really kind of a symbol of uh, Hinduism. Uh, and it, to me, I'm envious of that. I feel like when Heavenly Father asks us to do something, 
you know, don't go look for the one thing, but go tenfold, you know, and do, do your best, you know. We all, as, as Brother Schmidt talked about, we should be um, excellent, right? And I think that's really prevalent in Hinduism. So um, I think we're pretty much, we're running out of time, but uh, a little bit of best to best kind of things. We have karma and agency. Um, the decisions that we make will, you know, they affect us in our lives, right? We also have the Godhead. So Daniel talked a little bit about the Trinity. We have the afterlife. Um, Hindu, Hindus believe in reincarnation, and then we believe in, you know, also being judged into, you know, one of the three kingdoms, right? Uh, there's also the scriptures, which we talked about, hymns and bhajans, the word of wisdom. So, they, so Hindus don't always eat, some of them don't eat meat because they believe that they shouldn't harm other life forms. There's also meditation in temples, but I, I know for sure that, you know, that if we look into these other religions, we can learn a lot about ours. I'll learn about maybe, learn a lot about how we should be um, in the gospel. So, uh, I know those things to be true, and I hope you guys really enjoyed this uh, and that you learned a little bit more about Hinduism. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.